Hello, everyone. I'm Matthew Taylor. Uh, I'm the RSA's Chief Executive, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to uh, today's conversation. Uh, and I'm particularly excited that we have with us uh, Nicholas Christakis. Um, I'll tell you a bit about Nicholas, but I just want to say before I tell you more about him that it's particularly interesting for me and exciting for me because Nicholas was one of the first really big name speakers we had when I started as Chief Executive of the RSA many, many years ago. And so it is great to have you back again talking to the RSA audience, Nicholas. Nicholas is Sterling Professor of Social and Natural Science and Director of the Human Nature Lab at Yale University. Um, as a physician, sociologist, leading network scientist, he's got a unique set of insights into the extraordinary global crisis that we're all currently living through. So Nicholas, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to have a, a chance to talk to you uh, again. And first of all, how are you? <laughs> well, thank you very much for having me back. It's a bit of an odd experience, obviously, that we're all working from home. Uh, we're fine. My wife and I and our adult children, and we have a, a newly adopted 10-year-old uh, boy, uh, are all hunkered down in our, um, in our home in uh, the northern part of the United States. It's a peculiar characteristic of the crisis, isn't it, that, that many people, possibly you know, people like us who spend a lot of our time kind of writing and reading anyway, that in some ways... It, you know, it's quite nice being isolated, spending more time with family, a bit more peace and quiet. Do you think that makes it harder for us to engage with the scale of the crisis when quite often it feels very different for us personally? Well, you've highlighted a several ideas, actually, in that. First is the fact that this, um, the, the expectations that have been put on us for in terms of so social isolation and physical distancing uh, affect people differently based on their personality. You know, some of us are more introverted or more misanthropic, you know, uh, based on our household arrangements. Some of us have children, some don't, based on our occupations. Some of us can work from home, some cannot. So you're right to highlight that. But another part of your idea was the fact that, in a way, unlike something like a war or a riot or, or some kind of collective challenge, or, or, uh, or like the Chernobyl disaster, for example, uh, where, where everyone could see everyone else experiencing this condition. Right now, we're all isolated from each other, kind of dimly aware of what's happening, as it were. So it, it's a bit odd where we're having a kind of collective catastrophe, but we're experiencing it separately, um, you know, separated one from the other. It reminds me a little bit of um, one of my favorite New Yorker cartoons is of people walking along Broadway, little kind of matchstick people. And in the background, there's a skyscraper. On top of the skyscraper, there's an enormous rabbit clawing airplanes out of the sky from the Empire State Building. And one of the person is saying to the other, I guess if it was a gorilla, people would take it seriously. <laughs> um, so... The, the, your point about the way in which, I mean, let, let, well, there's so many things to talk about, Nicholas. One of the things I'm interested in is, is how we perceive risk. The, you know, this is something that's really interesting about this. And my, my, one of my observations is how different it is when you actually know somebody who's got sick. Um, that changes the nature of it. Yes. I think we're going to reach a critical threshold in our society as the number of cases rises, and in particular as the number of deaths rises, where eventually everybody will know somebody who died. It's actually quite a difficult mathematical calculation to do that. It depends on the structure of the social network and the distribution of connections. So for example, if one person is very popular and has a thousand intimate friends, which is not realistic, and that person dies, then a thousand people will have had that experience. Obviously, we're also talking about celebrities. I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that the British Prime Minister is, is quite ill at the moment, and I hope he recovers. Uh, and we've had other famous people who've been affected, and, and they get everyone's attention. But what you're asking is a little different, which is when people personally come to know other individuals who are sick. And right now it's uncommon. But we know from past work, for example, with the increasing normalization of homosexuality in our society, we had this cascade effect, whereas people began to come out of the closet, and then more and more people came out of the closet, eventually when there were so many people out of the closet, everyone knew someone. Their brother was gay, their sister was gay, their uncle, their friend, their coworker. And it, it, helped, it helped to dramatically you know, improve, in my view, this, this development was a phenomenally positive development in our society. But it had this cascade effect where people could knew somebody and that made a difference in their thinking because that person was a nice person and a normal person and so on. 
So I think the same thing is likely to happen with COVID. As the number of cases rises, eventually everybody will know someone who died uh, or was seriously ill, and this will get people's attention even more, and I think will make them more willing to pay some of the necessary sacrifices we all are going to have to pay to cope with this very unusual event in our lives, which is the, you know, the introduction of a new pathogen into our species. And I'll say one more thing, which is that we're basically in the middle of a plague and plagues have afflicted human beings for millennia. We have writings about plagues that go way back. And what's, what we just don't think it's normal, you know, we haven't experienced it because there hasn't been a serious plague in our lifetimes, but, but, it's, but it's not an uncommon thing to happen in our species or in, in, in human uh, civilization. And so I think we, we just need to come to terms with the fact that this is a time of plague and there are unusual things that we're going to have to do in order to cope with it. Nicholas, you're a very high profile thinker and you've particularly carved out the space of the kind of relationship between science and society, using science to understand society, the relation, but also the relationship between kind of social attitudes and scientific change. You must have been, I'm sure you have, I know you have been called upon a lot as this crisis has unfolded to give people advice, but also to yourself innovate in relation to response to it. So tell us some of the things that you've been asked to do and some of the things you've been involved in doing in just the last few weeks. Right. Well, I, I, can't, I can't discuss all of the, uh, the people that I, I have uh, spoken with. I mean, I was pleased that the Prime Minister of Greece actually uh, reached out a few weeks ago, and I had a very interesting conversation with him um, regarding... Um, the Greece's particular response, and I think Greece saw what was happening in Italy, was quite alarmed and was motivated to take action more swiftly. And I'm very pleased that Greece seems to be doing reasonably well uh, compared to other European countries. And other similar such individuals I have, in, have, in fact, been speaking to. What happened, though, in my own life was much more humdrum and modest, which is beginning around January the 24th, I, I've had a long-term collaboration with some Chinese scientists and I was dimly aware of what was happening in Wuhan in January. But around the 24th or 25th of, of January, they wrote to me and said that they had certain kinds of data that could be useful in studying this, this new epidemic in China. And so I began working in earnest with them on January the 24th. And it was one of the more exciting moments in my scientific career um, in terms of the intensity of the work, because we, they were on the other side of the globe, 12 hours different from me. We were basically working around the clock as a team from the 24th of January, when incidentally the Chinese clamped down on their nation and uh, regulations were promulgated that restricted the movements of 930 million people. So 1 billion people were put under a form of home confinement beginning January the 24th or 25th. And this also got my attention because I thought to myself, the Chinese have basically detonated a social nuclear weapon. They, they see this threat as so severe that they have actually taken this extraordinary step. And so the enemy, that is to say the virus, must be a powerful foe uh, or is likely to be a powerful foe. Anyway, so I was working intensely with my, these colleagues uh, for the three-week period, and then we submitted the manuscript on the 18th of February, and we hope it'll be, will be out, will be published soon, in you know, next week or two. Uh, and then I began to think of other stuff that I could do uh, using the science in my lab. And in 2009, we had done some work with the H1N1 uh, epidemic using social networks. And we had invented some ideas about how you could take advantage of, of people's position in social networks to create a kind of uh, canary in a coal mine idea, a kind of sensor network. Like if we could identify certain people in the social fabric uh, they would be more likely to get infected sooner than others. And, and, and this tracking or some kind of tracking of that kind voluntarily done would allow us to forecast the course of the epidemic. So we had, we had invented those ideas about H1N1 and published them in 2009. So I thought well, we could resurrect those and create an app in 2020 that could be quite useful for human beings to cope with when we emerge from lockdown uh, to, to see when the epidemic is striking again, where uh, and in which populations. And furthermore, there will be a second wave of this epidemic almost for sure in the fall, in October, November, in the Northern Hemisphere in 2020. This app could help us that. That app is called 
Hunala, H-U-N-A-L-A, and will be hopefully available very soon. Anyway, so my laboratory, so I increasingly turn my laboratory, which is a group of about 20 or 30 people, to work more and more uh, on the coronavirus, like many labs around the country, I mean, around the world. I mean, the scientists around the world are sort of dropping what they're doing and tackling the pandemic. And in some ways, it's almost, it, it's almost a sinful delight in the sense that, you know, it's, it's like so exciting to be working on such an important problem and to just throw oneself over to one's work in this fashion. But of course, it's prompted by a very serious threat that human beings are facing. It's, you know, it's, it's, it, we're trying to avoid death and destruction and yet death and destruction are near. So it's, it's a bit of an awkward thing, but nevertheless, I increasingly directed some of the very talented young scientists and engineers in my lab to start working on these topics. And I would say about half of my lab's capacity is now working full time on coronavirus. And then and then as, um, you know, then as, as February wore on, I became increasingly disillusioned or disappointed or even disgusted with some of, this, some of the statements being made by leaders uh, around, the, around the world, in particular in the United States and even to some extent in the UK, and, uh, because there was just a lot of misinformation about what people were saying things. And I, me and other experts, we knew that this was a serious disease in February. And, we knew it was going to be pandemic and the, 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 the inability to face that reality by so many people in important positions was very disillusioning to me. So I decided in late February to start using a tiny Twitter following. I had at the time 50,000 followers just to start sending out basic epidemiological facts, like basic threads. And I, and several of those threads went viral and it was sort of gratifying to me in the sense that people were beginning to see basic facts. And then I started to get some press inquiries and I decided to spend some time trying to advance the public understanding of science. So then I started also spending a little time, you know, like interviews like this, basically trying to help people understand the unusual nature of this particular threat. Anyways, I haven't slept much in, in two months or two and a half months because that's what I, it's been all coronavirus all the time. Well, look, I mean, thank you for your work. And I, I want to pick up one particular thing that you said there, which is around, uh, kind of around data. So um, uh, I was talking to somebody who works in the regulator in, in this country for data, data privacy. Um, and we, you know, obviously they're thinking about some of the kind of implications of this, possibly in a kind of transitional period where we're at, where we're no having low no log having lockdown, but, but, but life is far from normal. And he said, of course, this will be so much easier if we're able to verify that some people have had the disease and have got immunity in countries that have got a, a unique digital signature for every citizen. This will be a very simple thing because they'll be able to attach it to the digital signature and you'll know who's immune and who's not. In other countries, it won't. Now, the reason I think this is significant is the way in which crises like this shape our behaviors. So our view here, Nicholas, I'm really interested to, to see whether you concur with this, is that the reason a crisis drives change is because before the crisis, there already was a case for change. There already was some capacity for change. It doesn't come from nowhere. Then the crisis reinforces, accelerates that, both in terms of attitudes, but also certain practices which prefigure the future. And then at the point at which you emerge from the crisis, you've got the political alliances and the policy ideas, the innovations ready to take advantage of, of that wider Overton window, as it were, to drive change. I mean, so do you think that's an accurate account of the relationship between crisis and change. And what are the other things that you think this crisis might shift in terms of public attitudes? Well, you, you, it's, it's interesting because I, I think you're absolutely right. And we know from past uh, pandemics that there have been shifts in behavior so um, that were very dramatic. And for example, while it wasn't quite a pandemic, it was certainly epidemic, HIV. When I, I was, I'm a hospice doctor and I was trained as an internal as an internist, and in the 1980s and 1990s, when I was a young doctor, HIV was a very ascendant concern and was killing people. We sort of forget, like 
uh, amongst, amongst people that were intravenous drug users, amongst uh, homosexual men, amongst uh, people from Haiti. These were the risk groups back then. And uh, uh, for various idiosyncratic reasons, which is how the pathogen happened to take root in these populations. And at the time, there were all kinds of behaviors that were associated with, uh, for example, being gay, uh, including, for example, uh, there were uh, so-called bathhouses in San Francisco where you could have sex with many other people if you wanted, condom use was low, and so on. Uh, and these behaviors all changed, right, dramatically. Uh, within a course of a few years, things that were very deeply personal about people's sexual behaviors, the, the impact of the pathogen changed them. Or to pick a different example, with the 1918 influenza pandemic, maybe, maybe, I mean, I actually hadn't zeroed in on this until recently. You know how in, in Westerns there's always a spittoon? You know, there's like a, a brass thing that you spit in when you go into a bar and all this stuff. And there were spittoons everywhere. And, and these, you know, you can now find them in antique shops. They were sort of curiosities like these spittoons. Well, why? What got rid of the spittoons? Did, did people previously used to spit a lot and then... Now they don't need to spit, or what happened? Well, it turned out it was socially normative to spit in public, for instance, into a spittoon prior to 1918. But with the 1918 pandemic, they realized that this was a risk, a risk. And there were even big billboards that said spit equals death, for example, on the back of, of trolley cars in cities in the United States. And behavior changed. People stopped spitting in public, and the spittoons were you know, eliminated. And, I, I don't think there's probably a single spittoon in all of London. Maybe there is in a some place. But anyway, the point is, you're right to highlight how epidemic disease can change behavior, even behavior that is considered to be so normative. One of the things that I've been tracking, and I'll come to your specific example about privacy in just a moment, having set this background. One of the things I've been tracking is all the ways in which this epidemic is going to change rules regarding the provision of health care healthcare in the United States for the better. So, for example, there's been a lot of people have always said, well, why do I need to go see my doctor if I just need my prescription refilled? Seems very wasteful. I have to go see the doctor. I wait. The doctor has to waste time. Why can't I just call the doctor and have the doctor refill my prescription online? Well, the Chinese moved half their health care online during the, you know, in December and in, in January, or rather in January and February. And America right now is doing the same thing. Like the hospitals that I'm affiliated with are radically changing rules and regulations. The insurance companies don't require you to go see your therapist face to face in order for the therapist to bill. They are rightly realizing the therapist can provide almost as good a service, you know, using this type of medium. And so why shouldn't they pay for it? So, and, and rules regarding licensure, like previously doctors were licensed state by state. Now all the states are saying, no, no, it's fine. Any doctor who wants to come, can practice. These rules were always silly. So all of these things are changing with respect to healthcare. Now, your example specifically had to do with privacy. And here, I don't know if the trend, here I'm worried, and I don't know if the, the epidemic will necessarily have beneficial changes. So the Europeans in general had been moving more and more to respect privacy. But there are many ways in which technological tools have been used, for example, in China, in Singapore, in South Korea, in Taiwan, in ways that in Europe and in the United North America, we might regard as uh, in un in unacceptable intrusions. Like the state will track where you are and who you've talked to in partnership with firms, for instance. Or you'll have some kind of digital passport, as you suggested, that now appends to it your immunity status with respect to coronavirus. And, uh, and to me, some of these things I recognize that they would be incredibly useful, and we can talk about that if you want, like ways in which it would be useful in enforcing quarantine or in, or in facilitating contact tracing or in reliably identifying who is and who is not immune. All of these things would be very useful, but I would be very wary of rapidly going to uh, relaxing our standards of privacy and incidentally other civil liberties, which I also think in a time of plague it's very common for the far left and the far right to seize power. And I'm very worried about that. And I'm beginning to see indications of that around the world. And I do not think we, we need to surrender our civil liberties in order to effectively fight the uh, coronavirus. In fact, in some ways, the opposite. In some ways, we're going to beat this virus by transparency, by honesty, by integrity, by open communication among scientists, 
by encouraging people to work together and not be suspicious of each other, suspicion, censorship, silence, these things will, will undermine our ability to work together to fight the virus. And in any case, I don't see them as consistent with human nature, which is another whole topic. Well, I'd like to get into that topic now, because if, if you were speaking to us in, in more typical times, Nicholas, we would be uh, getting you to <laughs> talking about this uh, splendid uh, book, which has uh, been um, uh, lifting my spirits in self-isolation over the last few days. Now, uh, I, I mean, there's so much in the book that is relevant to this conversation. But I want to just pick a couple of things. So we're doing a lot of work about how the, how, how the pandemic might change the world. But one of the things you want to say in the book is that there's only so far you can change the way in which societies work. You have this phrase, the social suite, which is the characteristics of successful societies. And you want to say that they're, that they're kind of universal. So would I be right in saying that what you want to say is that when we think about change after the virus, don't think that you can invent a type of society that's never existed before, because that's extremely unlikely. We've been around for a long time and our human nature is pretty fixed. But what we could do is have a society which is a better reflection of that social suite, a better reflection of what we know about what makes us happy and what makes society tick. Would that, would that be your kind of, your, your position, Nicholas? Yes, I mean, I would, you know, and I, I know that, I know that I'm an optimist and that I'm, I'm um, a very positive regard for humanity. Like, I think, I think well of our species. You know, I'm very impressed with us as an animal. And, um, and find many of our qualities magnificent and worthy of admiration. And, um, you know, the subtitle of the book is The Evolutionary Origins of a Good Society. And the book is about how natural selection shape not just the structure and function of our bodies, as many people understand and accept, nor just the structure and function of our minds and our behaviors, but how natural selection also shape the structure and function of our societies, how we live together, and, uh, and in fact shape those societies to be good and to have these good qualities. For example, love and friendship and cooperation and teaching these are elements of what I call the social suite, and there are other elements as well, like social networks, for example. And um, what's amazing about a lot of those qualities, these are, these are all qualities that we manifest between. We love each other. We are, befriend each other. We cooperate with each other. We teach each other, right? These are not things that we do. We don't love ourselves or befriend ourselves, for example. We learn on our own, but we don't teach ourselves. We teach someone else. These are all very actually unusual and rare properties in the animal kingdom. Many animals can learn on their own independently. A little fish in the sea can learn that if it swims up to the light, it'll find food there. Some animals learn socially, and this is very efficient. You put your hand in the fire, you learn that it burns you. That's independent learning. Or I can watch you put your hand in the fire, and I get almost as much knowledge, but I pay none of the price. That's really efficient social learning. Or, or you eat red berries and you die. I watched you eat red berries. I said, oh my God, I shouldn't eat red berries. I learned a lot and I paid no price. That's magnificent. But we do something that's even more uncommon. We affirmatively teach each other things. I teach you how to build a fire. And this is exceptionally rare in the animal kingdom, but it's universal in us and we take it for granted. Now, why are all these things important? Because the germ, the pathogen, the coronavirus, is exploiting some aspects of how we live together. The germ, if we lived as isolated individuals, at, like some animals, you know, and had no contact with each other, we wouldn't be subject to contagious diseases that spread by interpersonal contact. So the germ takes advantage of our natural tendency to befriend each other, to assemble in groups, to touch and hug each other and console each other, and it uses those against us to spread. So in a way right now, we're being called upon to suspend those very natural tendencies and to engage in physical distancing. But there are other natural qualities we have which the germ does not take away. For example, as I mentioned, our probability of our, or our capacity for cooperation. So even as the germ is obliging us to abandon our physical contact with each other, it does not suspend our capacity to cooperate. So while I'm physically distancing from you, I need to band together with you to fight this pathogen. And we are a cooperative species, which is terrific. And teaching. So the way we're gonna beat this pathogen is by exploiting our capacity for teaching. 
We can teach each other. We can learn from the Italians. We can learn from the Chinese. I can learn from my neighbors. I don't have to experience the illness and death on my own. I can look around me. I can learn from the past. We're a cultural animal. You can go to any library in the United States and get a book out that says National Preparedness for Influenza Pandemics. In other words, people know what to do. This is not a new, it, it feels new and awful to us, but they're historians and epidemiologists that have studied the impact of plagues for a very long time. So we can use these tools that we are naturally, these capacities that we have naturally, naturally have and that, we've, that evolution has shaped in us uh, to fight this coronavirus, which is, I think, what I am seeing around the world and what, what actually makes me happy. Scientists are collaborating and cooperating. Uh, states are cooperating. Uh, people are cooperating. We, people are teaching and learning from each other. And so we're going to use these tools, I think, successfully to see the other side of this, this epidemic. So, Nicholas, tragically, we're running out of time, but I want to ask you one last question, which is, you know, more broadly, one of the characteristics of the time we're living through is it does reinforce our common humanity. And it seems to me to do that in two ways. First of all, we can all get this. Yes. And then secondly, yes. that from thoughtful people at least, it reminds us of the fact that you know, there you are in Vermont in your, in your house, so here I am in South London, my house. It's kind of okay for us. It feels very different if you're in a you know, council in, a, in social housing flat with you know, three or four children and nowhere to, no space outside, or um, you know, if your small business is, is folding. And for example, some of the statistics in the States about the higher levels of incidence for the African-American population, higher levels of mortality as well are pretty shocking. I know it's a big question, but what do you think will determine whether or not we draw the right lessons from this? Because there is, of course, another story, a story of polarization, a story of blaming people, yes. a story of division. And you know, your book has a fascinating chapter, which I recommend to people, about how people cope with shipwrecks. And sometimes they cope really, really well, and most people survive, and people actually look back on it with some pleasure, and other times it's a very different story. So if I had to put you on the spot and say, because what, what, what is the key character, the key factor that's going to determine whether we come out of this into a better world or a worse world? Okay, you're very right to highlight all of those things in my view, and I have been thinking about them too, and, and there are moments when I get very depressed by, by them. So first of all, you highlighted the fact that on some level, this is a, a, a threat to all of us. It's a pathogen. It spreads from person to person. Um, and it, if anything, it should highlight our shared vulnerability and our common humanity, uh, which is a, a theme and an idea that I very much, um, you know, espouse. But you're also right that there are classic cleavages in our society between the rich and the poor. And, um, and, and uh, other divisions in our society that, that may be magnified uh, by this. Uh, it, it is not a coincidence, you know, since time immemorial, when plagues have stricken, people and states have blamed other states. You saw this even play out in the, in the debate about the proper naming of this particular pathogen. You know, 1918 was called the Spanish flu. You know, during the, during the, uh, during the 16th century, when there were epidemics of syphilis, you know, the French called it the Spanish pox and the Spanish called it the French pox. And, you know, everyone was trying to blame someone else for this, you know, pox. And, uh, and so that also has played out. There's always this notion of like it's outsiders that are to blame. And so it, it, these, these epidemics and these times of stress can certainly call forward vile parts of our nature, our, our tendency to, 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 to dif distance ourselves from each other, to, to reinforce us versus them. Uh, dynamic. So even though the germ on one level, as you highlight, is highlighting our common humanity and our shared vulnerability, at the same time, it might elicit from us the opposite idea, which is, oh no, you know, we can shut our borders and protect us. Mathematicians and epidemi epidemiologists have studied this repeatedly. In the times of pandemics, unless you're an island state like New Zealand, for example, and you act very fast, uh, you, by the time you detect the pandemic, it's too late to shut your borders. Borders shutting really doesn't help much. Same in Europe. The idea that you're going to close borders between European states and stop the epidemic at the border is silly, honestly. 
And at best, it postpones the epidemic by a week or two or three or something like that. It still comes. The germ is everywhere. And so, and so, so there is this way in which the, the pathogen or an epidemic, a time of epidemic, tempts us to our darker, you know, our darker side, but also I think calls for the better angels of our nature. And, and that's the side that, I, in my view, is going to allow us to beat the, the uh, pandemic back, not the dark side. Well, thank you for that, Nicholas. And um, if we had more time, I would I, I, I probe more because one of the concepts I really liked in the book was this notion of kind of mild hierarchy, that actually what you need is you need hierarchy. You can't do without it. But it needs to be a particular type of leadership. And, well, maybe, maybe we'll find time to have that. Yes, discussion. I'd be happy to. I'd be happy to come back and talk again if you want. So, thank you so much for your time, uh, uh, Nicholas. Um, as I said earlier, um, this book, uh, Blueprint, is fantastic. It's out in paperback, but it might be more realistic to get it as an ebook. Uh, I guess, right now, if you're social isolating, I can strongly recommend it, as I can all of uh, Nicholas's work. Before we sign off, a quick reminder to everyone watching to stay tuned to the RSA's channel in the coming weeks for all the latest online events and... Uh, podcast. So do look out for announcements as well as news about our policy development and of course the work of our 30,000 strong global fellowship network. So finally, thank you again to you, Nicholas Christakis, and thanks to all of you for watching. Thank you so much, Matthew. Thank you for having me. Thank you.